We can only be as good as the food we eat. And so to have an agriculture based on that kind of chemical allopathy, based on a almost total destruction of the soil life forces through excessive tillage, through the use of herbicide, um, to have an agriculture that crops land for three, four months, the corn and the soybeans, fields that you see flying over the, the heart of our country, and then lets the land lie fallow, you know, that's a sin. That, that is like a human sin, a species sin, because what we're doing is disengaging the photosynthesis engine. There should be a cover crop there. There should be a living soil. There should be carbon being pumped down into that soil. And that only happens when plants grow in sunshine. And to take those plants away and totally break that system apart, um, that's the face of industrial agriculture for me. And, and it's something that needs to shift. Welcome to the Real Organic Podcast. I'm Lindley Dixon, co-director of the Real Organic Project. We're a grassroots, farmer-led movement with an add-on organic food label to distinguish soil-grown crops and pasture-raised livestock under the organic seal. You just heard from apple farmer Michael Phillips, author of Mycorrhizal Planet and The Holistic Orchardist. Michael's words speak to the intersection of biology and spirituality that many organic farmers experience as they tend their land and crops. All farmers work really hard, and most of us do it for the love of the land. If you'd like to find a real organic farm near you, please visit realorganicproject.org forward slash farms. Now let's get back to the conversation between my co-director Dave Chapman and Michael Phillips of Lost Nation Orchard in New Hampshire. Welcome to the Real Organic Podcast. I'm very happy on this cool fall day to be talking with Michael Phillips. Michael's an old friend and uh, a well-known teacher about organic orcharding. And for many years he has. Uh, he's written a number of books. The last one is Michael Reisel Planet, which is uh, important. They're all important. So welcome, Michael. It's good to be here, Dave. So tell me, uh, if you would, a little bit about how you became an organic grower of tree fruit? Well, deep in my heart, I'm a tree person. So you, you discover that part of connection with trees. And when you're connecting with trees, you're connecting with roots down in the ground and the fungal element comes into play. And, and it just, it all speaks to me. And not only that, when I harvest, I harvest standing up as opposed to the guys in the field. Um, and I got into, <laughs> holistic orcharding, um, totally naive. I was reading the Rodale rid literature of the 70s, 80s. Um, I was making many sulfur sprays, etc. And there was kind of, my wife Nancy was on a, her own path to discover herbal medicine. And I learned through her that if I can support the system through nutrition, I'm going to become a much better grower because plants, us, all mammals, birds, we all kind of share the same origins, that, that kind of connection to bacteria and fungi. And so when I started working with that aspect to my orcharding, getting away from thinking allopathically where sulfur sprays deal with disease to understanding how the right nutrients and friendly microbes are what truly deal with disease, and that a little disease is okay, it just opened up the windows in a big way for me to continue to take this further and further. I, I tell people who are beginning, you plant your first tree and it's gonna take several years before that tree develops strong branches to hold some fruit. And it's, it's not unlike you as a learning grower, you're, you're on this learning curve. And what's fascinating is that learning curve continues as we hit 60 and 70 and 80, it, it doesn't end. And I'm just enjoying the ride. Yeah. What you talk about is uh, uh, an important distinction. I, I, I heard a, a webinar yesterday, and they were talking about uh, sort of the principles of regenerative agriculture, and they went through all these things like cover cropping and keeping the ground green and minimal tillage, and 
I consider all of them to be the, the basic principles of uh, organic farming. And then they added and organic inputs, meaning organically approved uh, fertilizers. And, and I thought, well, yeah, we should use organically approved fertilizers, but they're missing the whole point of what organic means. And I think you speak to it well that organic is ultimately uh, at its core is about biology rather than chemistry. I think so. I, I think we've really overlooked that. And, and, and what's fascinating in the, the, the tree realm is I think a lot of us have a sense of the soil food web, the mycorrhizal fungal network, and all that's going on there. And, and when I say we have a sense of it, we know like 5% of the details, but, but that's important. But what we overlook is that the biology rises up and it's on the surface of the tree. You know, Steiner talks about an, a tree, um, the leafy part, the flower is the fruit. That's the vegetative aspect, but the tree itself is a rising of the earth and, and not so much the soil, but you can kind of get a sense of that when you think about bark, but it's those microbes. Just like I'm sitting here and I'm a community of a hundred trillion organisms. I'm a community. The plants, the trees have that community aspect and it's part of my defense against disease, against that pathogen invader. And, and that's really the key element, what I call competitive colonization or biological reinforcement. I utilize effective microbes. Some people work with compost tea. There's, there's many ways to go about that. But when we start to recognize our plants, our crops are part of a community, not just through their roots, but connected as well through microbes on their surface. It, it just changes the whole perspective. And, you know, often when I'm talking about organic agriculture, it's like, what about organic health? What if we had organic doctors for our own health? <laughs> and we added that element, that perspective, that holism. Uh, I think we'd go a lot further. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a, a woman that I talked to from Germany said it beautifully. I'm not talking about an organic product or an organic brand. I'm talking about an organic landscape that we need to develop a community in which the manure that I get for the compost that I make is also organic and the animals were fed organic feeds and, and you know, the whole thing works together as part of a system. So I, I want to talk about a, a bit about your understanding of the biology, the amazing uh, community that each of us is and that when we participate in what I would call a sane agriculture, it's a huge, huge uh, community. But I'm curious, was this, you talked about that you're still learning, you're still learning, me too. So have your, have, has your understanding of what you're doing changed a lot in the last 30 years? Oh, absolutely. Just given that I started at that point of there's pests and disease, we need to spray for that, to now understanding that there's nutritional and biological deficiencies, and that's why spray medicines are used. So rather than go for the medicine shelf, I'm going to go for working to make sure that that nutritional aspect, the biological pieces are in place. You know, one of the things I do, and this kind of makes a complete circle, is um, I utilize certain plants, um, things like comfrey and green nettle, which are both rich in calcium and other nutrients. Nettle, when it goes to the seeded stage, and horsetail are rich in silica, and I make fermented plant extracts. And I add effective microbes to that. I add milk to the calcium brew. Um, but when I go to spray these things, you know, it's all derived here on the farm. And it just feels so good because these are the plants growing underneath the tree, sharing with the tree so that the tree has higher levels of calcium and silica, which is basically really key nutrients for an apple tree, a fruit tree to resist rot organisms. It's part of the package along with the microbes. And Again, that sense of like, this is all from my farm. The circle is complete, that biodynamic principle. And this isn't to say I don't buy things. I do buy liquid fish in barrels. I get seaweed kelp powder from a company in Maine. But I'm really trying to limit that. And even with the pests, 
I will use some of the biological toxins, things like spinosad, um, venerate from our own innovations. Um, but I use them judiciously, and it's because I need to nudge back certain insects at certain time. But I also recognize there's a place for those insects as well. And, and that's also another step when you talk about shifting your consciousness over the course of, of 30 years, recognizing that all species are here, they all play a role, and I might want to temper <laughs> Kakuleo at certain times, but I also know Kakuleo has a place as much as I do. Yeah, yeah. So you're seeking balance. I'm seeking balance in my favor. <laughs> <laughs> good. So, uh, good. Let me offer you a, a, a challenge because this is a conversation that, that I have with some people. Do you think that if you got the soil uh, really right, if you did everything that is doable to create the balance in the soil, do you think you would still need sprays of any kind? I, I love this question. Do I need sprays of any kind if I have the soil absolutely perfect? Well, it's moments like these where I, I talk to plum cuculli or apple maggot fly. And in this case, we have species whose biological imperative to feed and to reproduce is targeted on tree fruit. So I might make my trees a little stronger on this side of the fence if there's, let's say, weaker trees over here. And maybe that will help with that. As far as disease goes, yes, the soil has a balance to it and delivers nutrients to the plants. Um, sometimes those nutrients have been oxidized. I'm thinking of manganese, iron, um, and it's not quite working fully in terms of the vascular system of the tree. So when I use foliar applications of manganese or iron in my holistic sprays, I'm, I'm kind of working with that. Um, to, to help get beyond that oxidation that happens when certain organisms in the soil change the way the nutrients are delivered. I personally feel that my trees stay in place, obviously, um, and when I come through and I reinforce the biological connection, the competitive colonization on the plant, that's necessary in part because UV light excess heat, ex drought, all those are factors that diminish microbe populations. So things happen out there that keeping that up um, is really important, particularly in the primary windows when disease infection is active, occurring out there in the orchard. And, and similarly, with the pests, to me, yes, the soil is very important, but then now we introduce another key element of my holistic approach and and that's outrageous diversity. And now I'm engendering all kinds of friendly, beneficial species that are going to help keep that pest aspect in check. I, th I think at least apple growers, fruit growers, have a stewardship role. And, and I think that one of the things that's important to understand here is that the sprayer is just a tool. It's what you put in the spray tank. You know, when I speak to a at conferences, I say, this is, we've come to my NRA moment. It, it's, it's what you put in that spray tank. And when it's biology and nutrition and herbal medicines, in order to grow your crop, what a wonderful tool. I, I have a good time spraying because it's not toxins and it's not excess sulfur. I might dip into a, a copper spray in early spring once every 20 years. That's been the pattern because a certain pathogen gets a foothold, and I want to kind of knock that back. But for the most part, um, you got to do everything you can for the soil, support the soil food web, but you still have stewardship roles depending on the crop. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that you just brought up that I think is very important is that soil is the critical foundation, but climate, humidity, light, you know, these things all change from year to year, from day to day, and they are also part of uh, whether or not a person or, or a plant would need medicine. And uh, one of the things that Brian O'Hara said to me, uh, I had not thought of this, is that as we 
as we face greater environmental degradation, as the air changes that we're breathing. Yes. Right. That we have to go beyond just the organic of Albert Howard to an even better, a deeper organic, because we're facing greater threats, greater challenges for a plant just to be healthy. He said, look at the woods. They are not healthy right now because of so much of human activity. You agree with that? I, I would agree with that. We, we have changed many things. You know, what comes down with the rain is not just good water to replenish the earth, but a lot of those chemicals that have gone up into the atmosphere, and that impacts the soil. And we were tuned into the fact that DDT was being spread through the atmosphere. Similarly, glyphosate. I mean, this is an organic farm. That doesn't mean some of that doesn't come down here on these trees. And so working to beef up the fungal connection, um, applying nutrients and replenishing the biology on the surface of the tree. You know, this, this kind of also gets me into a, a whole other area that I think is important to understand. As humans, we, we progress and, and we, we gain a little chunk of knowledge and then we realize maybe we misstepped a couple steps in getting to where we were and take it back. And, and what I want to talk about right now is foliar feeding. This idea that I have to be out there not too long after dawn with my specific nutrients that have to be taken in by the stomate on the underside of the leaf in order to be used by the tree. Um, I think some of that kind of direct connection happens, but more so, I recognize now that the microbes on the surface of the plant, and many of these organisms are the same as those found in the soil, process, assimilate, and min mineralize those nutrients. And it's, it's over a period of time that it's made available to the plant. And I, I think the next exciting thing is gonna be when we, we start to understand that the fungi that live in the cambrium, um, their hyphae actually penetrate out onto the surface, just like mycorrhizal fungi reach out in the soil to bring nutrients to the plant. And, and that's what's, when I talk about the learning curve, these next 10, 20 years, I, I think we're going to start to find out how that works and, and really become good stewards of what we're trying to do to grow food for ourselves. Uh, yeah, that's very exciting. So is this learning... Of course, it's a group effort, but I mean, is there a community now, a worldwide community that is pinging each other and going, I tried this, I saw that. Is this based on research that comes out of universities? Where, where does the learning come from? I'm, I'm sure a, lo a lot of your learning comes from your trial and error, but I know it's not limited to only that. So as a fruit tree grower, I helped start something called the Holistic Orchard Network. And there are some, there's some pinging going on there. <laughs> that's, that's good and, and helps us, if you're reading some of the forum discussions, advance your thinking or have a new idea. I think another part of this, and this is going again to, to Steiner, is to, to understand that our intuition and our imagination are really, really important skill sets. And that when we listen and we observe nature, there is a communication that takes place. And we may not understand it right away. And we, we might shift what we're doing. And, and, and I've been doing this. And then we see that, wow, this, something happened here. This, this is a big improvement. Um, and then we can have science and we can come and improve it. And that's, that's fine. But I, I think there's people who are gifted to receive information direct from nature. And that is part of our opportunity to learn how to be better growers. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you are uh, uh, exceptional in your ability and willingness to share what you learn from nature. So, you, you know, you give talks, you write books. I'm, I'm fascinated by the network effect. Um, a lot of what you learn, it's because you're sitting in a very quiet orchard. You live in a beautifully quiet place here. I hear, I hear some chickens and I hear water running and not much else. But um, 
you also go out in the world and share these ideas. I know, I know that, that a lot of people have read your books and been inspired. Um, what about mycorrhizal planet? I, I think that, uh, when I, I saw that book, I, I thought, okay, so here's a, a citizen scientist. And I say that because I don't know, but I don't think that you have, um, advanced degrees in soil science or do you? No, I, I do not. Yeah. Right. But you, you spent a lot of time studying it and, and studying not only what you observe, but also a lot of, of what the scientific community is observing. Could you talk about the process of writing that book? And I mean, it's a big, big subject. So let's start with that. Like, how did you come to write that? So my goal in writing Mycorrhizal Planet was to make the fungi alive. You know, I'm, I'm not a mycologist. I, I don't have advanced degrees in soil science and what have you. But what I have is this ability to look at those science papers and maybe pull out the 5%, maybe we'll give them credit, we'll say 10%, <laughs> that a farmer, a grower, a person who wants to get their hands in the earth and honor the earth and, and work with plants could use. And to take those threads and to weave a tapestry, well, that's what you do when you, you write a book. And, and my goal, one goal, was to help growers understand we need to think of the fungal network as our friend, as, as a fellow being. That, that already shifts so many things because you, you don't go till your friends. You, you don't go uh, turn your friends over at night and tear their roots out of the ground. And so that introduces all kinds of regenerative practices from the, from the perspective of respect for the soil life. Um, and then it gets really fascinating when you start to understand how the mycorrhizal network, it's all about collaboration, about working to help the other, so you in turn are helped. It's that building of community. It's a mutual symbiotic relationship that fungi have with plants. And when you go back 450 million years in time and the oceans are drying up and in the tidal pools, there are the vast, the ancestors of vast vascular plants, consider that to be like algae, but these are plants without roots and how the tidal pools are drying. But also in that same water were oceanic fungi, which had these filaments to pick up nutrients. And that's where this connection between plants and fungi began. And it's only improved since, but it's also incorporated the trees. That's, that's kind of a different fungal route to get there. I'm talking now about ectomycorrhizal fungi, and in the first grouping, it's the endomycorrhizal fungi. There are nuances to be understood. You know, the human, <laughs> interestingly, I, I get asked a, this a lot. So I grow wheat, or I'm going to grow this old strain of wheat, <laughs> and which is the right fungi to connect with that plant? And I say, no, wrong question. The right question is, how can I farm and steward my land so that there are a good 50 different species of mycorrhizal fungi working together and networking with not just a wheat plant, but many different plants. And, and being able to articulate that, to share that vision of how the common mycorrhizal network actually works. Um, Steiner, again, called it the common root being. I, I, I like that term. Um, it really helps me a lot as a fruit grower to outrageous diversity and all those different flowering plants and shrubs. Um, they're out there, so there's more beneficial insects, but they also introduce more species of mycorrhizal fungi. And there are passage plants and bridge trees where nutrients are not taken by the plant it was delivered to, but passed on to the next plant who might actually pass it on to the plants that are struggling over there in the far corner. And again, I, it's we're like in kindergarten. Um, and maybe that's giving us more credit than we, we have due. But there's so much more to understand. But just to, to be able to stand back and appreciate that this fungal network takes care of things. I, I know earlier you said in the forests, we see that even the trees are struggling in places because of the toxins in the sky and some of the things we've done. But this is a self-healing network as well. And what our, one of our primary directives right now as humans is to restore all the degraded land 
To get that fungal connection back in plant place so plants in turn can be healthy and photosynthesize and get our planet back in balance. And it, it is truly one of the keys to restoring this earth. Yeah. So for civilians listening to this, and I hope there will be people who don't know much about, you know, it's, it's become a, a thing now that people kind of know about the microbiome, the human microbiome. They go, I get it. There's a whole lot of me that doesn't have my DNA. Uh, I am a community. Right. It's like they get that idea. Right. Right. You don't need to be a microbiologist to understand that idea. So could you explain some of what you're talking about with plants and fungi and their relationship to each other so that one of those civilians can kind of get it? Okay. So we'll kind of do this as a human analogy. We, we take a plant that's in an herbicide strip so there's no competition from other plants. We take a plant that's in a field fed with NPK synthetic fertilizers. We take a plant that's growing in a hydroponic system, um, separated from the biology, separated from the soil. These are all plants that can get nourishment, but they're getting it more or less in junk food form. And, and they're getting it through the short straws of their feeder roots, being able to suck up whatever is brought through the groundwater, through the hydroponic system, um, and those nutrients are not necessarily in balanced form. It's, these are plants that are living on Doritos. On the other hand, we have plants that are connected to this community, connected to the biology. And now, rather than the short reach of where an individual plant's root system can go, um, take this apple tree right behind me. The root system here maybe extends several feet beyond the canopy of the tree, there's some depth, but most of the roots are in the top 10 inches, 12, 14 inches of soil. And that's the shopping district for that tree. And it can get manganese there and calcium there, but eventually the shopping district gets depleted. But when the fungal element is added, this long reaching mycelium, now the shopping district is much vaster and you have access to healthier foods so to speak, in balanced form. And that, to me, is, is what we're talking about in terms of plant health. So a plant that has those fungal friends accesses more nutrients in a balanced form, shares it with other plants in the community, and that in turn leads to more, more robust photosynthesis, more carbon being put in the soil. It's, it's what we're talking about. It's, it's life on Earth um, and understanding that it's this plant fungal connection, the symbiotic relationship, which was designed and is still working perfectly, and it's us who have to stop interfering with it. Can we talk about uh, that carbon is putting the soil, in other words, how it's paying for the, the food at the shopping district? Like the plant is definitely in a partnership, so it's also contributing. Right. So what we have here is an underground economy based on carbon, which is in the form of sugars that's produced in photosynthesis in the plant. The plant in turn will direct as much as two thirds of its photosynthates, not to its own growth and, and development, but through the roots to exchange with microbes. And, and mycorrhizal fungi are one group of players in this economy. The fungi in turn use that carbon to grow themselves, but also excrete some of that carbon in the form of lamellin, which then becomes part of long-term organic matter, um, soil fertility in the form of humus. And, you know, one, one example of collaboration here that comes to mind, I'd like to share this with you. I like this so much. Um, some of the fungi affiliated with trees in the forest the ectomycorrhizae, have explorer hyphae that reaches much as 12 feet down. That gets you down to bedrock. 
Those fungi take that carbon coming from the plant, delivered through the tip of their hyphae, and that carbon-rich fluid feeds bacteria living on the surface of the fungi, hyphae. And that enables the bacteria to produce organic acids, which dissolve the bedrock, which allows the fungi to take calcium and phosphorus and magnesium and what have you back up to the plant. And it's all based on that carbon dollar, but it's being shared by many different members of the community in ways we often don't think about. Um, and a good portion of it is saved. And that, again, is that humus factor. So I, I don't know if that works to help people understand what's going on, but it, it is one example that is just such a brilliant showing of, of what nature does. So plants through the fungi, through the bacteria, via the bedrock, we get minerals back on the surface of the earth. Yeah, beautiful. So uh, if we're on a junk food diet and we're just eating Doritos, we tend not to be very healthy. We're not even very happy. We're sort of depressed and miserable. I, I generally, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious. Do you think, uh, I, I think you do, but I'd like to hear you talk about it. You know, what's the difference in the health of a plant on a good diet, one provided by the fungi and the bacteria, as opposed to one on a junk food diet? Those plants on the junk food diet are subject to more disease and actually calling out the insects, come feed on me. And, and so you get involved with allopathic approaches, medicines, to fix that. That's a set of, a type of thinking that is just way too predominant. Humans made a wrong turn. The plants that are connected through the fungal network to other plants, sharing nutrients in balanced form, are going to photosynthesize more. They're going to have more carbon dollars to spend in the underground economy and just make things all the better. But they're also having a beefed up immune function as plants. And green immune function is not unlike our immune system in terms of warding off fungal, bacterial, and viral invaders. And with plants, it's, it's not antibodies and white blood cells, but it is certain phytochemical compounds, the secondary plant metabolites. I like to use the term resistance metabolites, the terpenoids, the flavonoids, etc., that herbalists get all excited about. But, but plants are using their own internal medicine to rebuff disease. And, and when you get into looking at systemic acquired resistance and um, the fact that we can induce this response through certain foliar sprays to, to understand that mycorrhizal fungi actually induce this response. This is how anything in nature stands up to the forces that would bring it down. And if it didn't work like this, we wouldn't be sitting here surrounded by green and, and a tree. There'd be no forest behind you. It would have all died long ago. Nature knows how to do health. And we're, we only become wise when we recognize that we need to emulate nature in our agricultural systems and, and how we care for this planet. Okay, so let's talk about human health for a minute. Um, we know that it's better to eat an apple than a Dorito, but is an apple an apple? Are all apples the same? That old saying, an apple a day will keep the doctor away. I was coined somewhere in the 1860s or so, and it was probably about selling more apples. But it was also a reflection of being aware that there's lots of good nutrition in an apple, and the pectin helps our bowel move, um, what have you. Today, depending on how that apple is grown, it may be that 64 apples a day are what's needed to keep the doctor away. And, and that may sound like I'm doing my marketing ploy, but what I'm referring to here is a fruit that's devoid of nutrition, doesn't have the same phytochemical connection, is not going to do the same for you as a fruit grown in a living soil system, as a fruit that deals with environmental reality. So I'm going to explain that 
idea of environmental reality. I'm an apple tree. <laughs> I have leaves. The rain falls. And scab spores come with that rain. And here or there, the fungal pathogen, the scab, sends out a hyphae to penetrate into the leaf cell in order to cause an infection, which is the disease issue that manifests and growers don't want to see or at least see too much of. I, on the other hand, recognize that the experience of scab trying to get a foothold means that the plant in turn responds with more phytochemical action, more richness. And so when I pick apples off my tree and here or there I see a, a fruit with a scab spot or two, and, and there isn't that much, I know that all the apples on that tree benefited from that systemic response. And so now the, the not just the nutritional aspect of the apple, but the medicinal virtue of the apple is that much higher. And, and so that's what I'm referring to about how was that apple grown? That makes all the difference in the world. Yeah, I've, I've uh, seen it suggested that um, the same thing, that part of the nutritional density of organic food, which has been shown in testing, um, is a result of the fact that, that the plants um, deal with stress. <laughs> they deal with stressors and and that's one of the things that tends to make uh the yields a little bit smaller but but much richer so you said uh, 64 apples i mean i'm just kind of curious i, I haven't I, figured I, that out that's Dave. poetic right it could be 28 apples yeah. it could be 202 but, I, but <laughs> you believe that that's true that that uh a modern industrial apple simply can't compare to an apple that you're growing in terms of its nutritional health-giving qualities? Not only do I believe it's true, but you see it in action. And whether it's you or me or a child or whoever eating an apple, the two versions, um, one gets eaten to the core and you wish there was more. The other, a few bites out of the surface and you're kind of done with it and want to find something more interesting. Our bodies know. What size is your orchard, just to give a sense of perspective? Like, how many acres of trees are you tending? A whopping three acres. Yeah, yeah. And it keeps me plenty busy. Um, I grow about 120 different varieties, which makes things very interesting when I'm marketing, selling the fruit, explaining the, the story behind each apple, how certain old heirlooms had a specific use, um, but whether it was for baking or making apple pan dowdy, what have you. Um, or for cider, for fermented cider as well as sweet cider. And it gets pretty complex to manage all that and, and just get to get to all the trees to, to manage the pruning. And, you know, on a, a heavy crop year, I could use help. Doesn't mean I have help. <laughs> I could use help. Um, but to go much beyond three acres is going to, I couldn't do it as I now manage mostly by myself. And it's also a happy place. And this is an important point, because as growers, as farmers, we need to make a living, but we certainly deserve to be happy too. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, it, you know, uh, you, you are an agricultural hero to me. I travel a fair distance to come get apples here every year, and uh, uh, I... I come twice. I come for early apples, and now I come for the northern spies. And I appreciate what you do very much. Um, and I think that so much of our food system is something that everybody takes for granted. And there are amazing things about it that you can go and get a strawberry every day of the year in almost every supermarket in America is amazing. And, and they're not rotten. Uh, I would say that they're fairly tasteless. I, I don't. I don't buy those strawberries because so many reasons. But, um, but some people do, and they appreciate them. And it's certainly still better than Doritos. What are your thoughts about the food system, the industrial food system that feeds America? And, and I would say at this point, there's developing an organic industrial food system as well, which is why the Real Organic Project exists, because we're saying, wait a minute, 
this is not not what we meant and in fact somebody was chiding me yesterday why weren't you shouting for the last 20 years and i said well i was busy farming <laughs> but it's a good question how could we have let this happen um i've discovered a, a great there's a lot that's out of out of our control but i also see that we can fight to still create and offer an alternative and i think you're certainly offering an alternative to that industrial system so how do you feel about the industrial system i hope it changes real soon um industrial agriculture again we, we've spoken about the mindset of we can have chemistry to deal with problems that are brought on by the fact that we're not letting plants actually be healthy. Um, we can make them quite robust with NP, synthetic fertilizers, but we're not getting all the medicinal, nutritional connections, which in turn feeds ourselves. And, and that's reflected by the amount of, of disease and obesity and hospitalization of, of our species um, because of the food we eat. We can only be as good as the food we eat. And so to have an agriculture based on that kind of chemical allopathy, based on a almost total destruction of the soil life forces through excessive tillage, through the use of herbicide, um, to have an agriculture that crops land for three, four months, the corn and the soybeans fields that you see flying over the, the heart of our country, and then lets the land lie fallow, you know, that's a sin. That, that is like a human sin, a species sin, because what we're doing is disengaging the photosynthesis engine. There should be a cover crop there. There should be a living soil. There should be carbon being pumped down into that soil. And that only happens when plants grow in sunshine. And to take those plants away and totally break that system apart, um, that's the face of industrial agriculture for me. And, and it's something that needs to shift. And I know people talk about can you organic guys feed the world it's like if there's enough of us yes we can feed the world and that's what we're working to change that's why i'm so pleased to call you my friend and, and know this work that you do for the real organic project is is getting us back to those kind of principles yeah it's such an important public conversation i you know i i i know many great organic farmers who are doing uh, a spectacular job. Some are certified, some are not, but uh, they are real organic farmers. And what I see is that uh, we're too isolated and we need to be talking. We need to be talking to the eaters who, who can't get the food that they want. They can get, they can get, so-called organic food every day in the store, but they have trouble finding out what that food is and they have trouble getting more and more. I'm seeing that a producer like you, I know that it's not the path that you follow, but if you did wholesale into the supermarket chains, you would have more and more trouble getting on the shelves now. Um, a young person coming in who read your books and talks to you and and plants a three acre apple orchard and tries to wholesale them to a chain would have more and more trouble getting in. And that's going the wrong direction. We need to, we need to change the food system. What you just talked about certainly is connected to the, the conversation about climate. Do you think about that? Do you, is that part, I, I understand that there's so many reasons why we want to keep photosynthesis going just for the health of the, of the land, just for the water cycle. But do you think about climate change as part of your conversation? Oh, well, climate change is, is at the core of everything now. You know, the future of our children and grandchildren, if we can even think that far anymore, we, we have to wake up. And when I talk about not leaving so many vast acreage fallow, not growing plants, not photosynthesizing. Um, that's a shift we can make. It's a, an easy, no-brainer step to take. 
the fact that we're struggling with it, uh, that's a reflection on our species needing to evolve a whole lot more, a whole lot faster. Um, when I make my fermented plant extracts and I, and I spray seed oils like neem and karanja, um, some people are working with hemp seed oil as a way to feed the microbes on the surface of the plant. And I'm producing this healthy community, this this fruiting community. Um, that approach applies to market gardening as well. It can be utilized by row crop farmers, not in quite the same way, not with the intensity that fruit requires. But there's a whole lot we can do under this banner of regenerative agriculture that's going to make a huge difference. And we got the farmer piece, and we got whatever portion of those growers have seen the light, so to speak. Um, and we got the consumer piece. And that's also a small portion that's seen the light. And you hope that that hundredth monkey effect is soon about to hit. and <laughs> Everyone's going to start to get it, that local, organic, holistic, living soil systems is where you want to get your food. And you want to live a, as healthy of a life as is possible, um, both your family, your friends, your neighbors. And you're doing it by making local agriculture work. You know, when we talk about the supermarkets and the, the struggle to get in a, a niche with your organic product in such places, I, I know that's the main mechanism of distributing food. My apples are sold in, in three local food stores. Um, and, and that's a whole nother model as well. You know, it, it, it comes down to making local work and we got to get the portion that's seen the light yeah. to share that love, to yeah. share that knowledge. Yeah. I was listening to uh, a symposium yesterday online, Al Gore's, uh, I think they call it Climate Underground. And it was very interesting. It was about how does climate change affect agriculture as well as how does agriculture affect climate change. There's a lot about how climate change affects agriculture, and it's not good news. Mm -hmm. It's not good news. Um, and Mr. Gore had, you know, tremendous detail and a very powerful slideshow. And then there was a discussion with Michael Pollan and Ricardo Salvador and, and some other folks, Keanu Mickey, and they were talking about, one of the things they talked about was the regenerative movement. And, uh, and Michael said, well, I think the first thing we need to do is define it because, you know, we're seeing Bear Monsanto claiming regenerative and we're seeing Cargill claim regenerative. And it's the same thing that we struggle with in organic. And at least in organic, we have a legal definition. They're just ignoring it. But, uh, you know, the legal definition actually is good. I have to say that the Organic Food Production Act is kind of an amazing law in that they really did a pretty good job of defining organic. They did. And, and it's all about the soil, and they say that over and over. They're just not following the law. That's why I'm in a lawsuit suing them. <laughs> I, go, Dave, go. I, I don't have a lot of hope. <laughs> but, but, you know, we have to try. That, that's a whole other question about, about politics. But I do think it's important that we just are aware that it doesn't matter what we call it. If we're successful, corporations are going to try and take it. It's what they do. You can't even blame them for it. It's like the scorpion stinging the, the fox as it's swimming across the river. And the fox is dying. says, why'd you do that? And the scorpion says, it's in my nature. Mm -hmm. yeah. So let's talk about politics. Um, and uh, yes, there's, there's, there's po you know, politics of voting for this person or that person. And then there's just seeing the political nature of, of uh, that everything we do basically involves a, a big community. And how do we influence that community? Do you think, I'm just curious, Michael, do you have hope? Any hope that we can move 
the political sphere to be more alignment in more in alignment with what we need in order to prosper as a planet, as a species, as a member of this community? Politics is a very difficult subject. And obviously we're all voting two weeks from now and with great hopes of change. But even that change will be nowhere near what you're talking about that needs to happen. And will that side of humanity wake up? I'm not sure. I think, you know, it's going to be a people-led movement creating local economies that shifts some of this. Um, government can be a force for good, just as it can be a force for not so good. The bigger things get, the harder it is to step back and say, am I doing something that's loving and respectful to the earth and to my fellow humans and to the other species I share this beautiful planet with? I don't know that you can organize that force, but it has to be like a something within us, a spark that we each find and, and we develop. And if that spark reaches a certain point and we get leaders who step to the plate with humility and modesty and not, not a directive to have self-gain as a big part of why they're doing what they're doing, we could see that shift. But I think things are going to have to tumble a bit before we do a reboot. And I'd like to see that reboot be better. And I'm all for the dedication of people like yourself. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm involved in local government. I'm a selectman on the that would be like a town council member uh, in, in my small town here in northern New Hampshire. And I, I can do some things that are useful. Um, other times it just seems like this is just another way to spin wheels. And I'm not really affecting it in the bigger way that I hoped. Um, but we need people to step up to the plate who have that ability to not lose sense of where their roots come from, who hold on to love and respect as guiding words for how to live your life. And it's hard with this political beast for such a people to find their way to expose themselves to all the, the pressures and the ugliness of, that has become politics. And on some days I'll say I'm hopeful and other days I'll say not so much. But what I know is when I get my hands in the earth, I'm a connected being and I can share that and maybe there'll be more connected beings and I'm going to hold to that as my hope, my big hope. Great. Well, is there, is there anything that we've missed that you think that is pretty important that you'd like to talk about? You know, just give you a chance to you're, you have a very uh, fertile mind. <laughs> so it's like making cider and it starts to really bubble. So. <laughs> so a, a farmer, this whole marketing thing, you have to find your niche. What's the crop you love? What are you good at? And now find people to love you for doing what you're good at and, and make it possible for you to make a living. And I'm in a very rural place. And this is actually a good question for us to address because um, a lot of farms are in rural places and seems to be less and less people that live in rural places because of the corporate takeover of industrial agriculture and all that. So here, I have been working around this notion of I want to make cider. I want to make real cider. That By that, I mean unpasteurized cider. And I don't want the government and regulators to interfere with that connection between me and my customer base who wants unprocessed cider, who wants the enzymes and all the healthy antioxidants that are in fresh juice. On the other hand, I know the laws are shifting and, and pasteurization is required if you want to wholesale. And my approach has been to create a cider club. 
And I'm in the process of, of getting 100 families to buy a $250 share, which is providing me with some funding to create the infrastructure I need to set up a cider press. I built this building behind you, which is my cidery, uh, and I'm really excited about it. You know, after 30 years of being a carpenter for others, it's like I'm getting to build my own magical place. Um, and the whole concept here is not unlike what those consumers who, in order to get raw milk, buy a share of the cow. By virtue of buying a share of the press, people are essentially processing the apples I provide, but, but it's their own press. It's their own juice that they're squeezing. And we're going to have glass jugs and people are going to refill it as needed and they get a discount on the price. And it's, it's all in this cider contract that only a farmer's fertile mind could come up with if you're not trained legally. Uh, I had fun with that. But I'm excited because now I'm, I'm, I'm actively enlisting, bringing together a community of people who get it on a deeper level. And that may have some use for other farmers. Certainly it does for other apple growers. Um, but oh, I almost don't want to say this. It's like we're creating a, a Sam's Club. <laughs> um, like you have a membership and now you're more connected. You're going to come. It's a little, it's different than the CSA, but it, it's saying we're all invested in something that makes our lives richer. And so to the degree that that can inspire other growers to see how can we make these connections more real. And in another way, it's like I've done an Amazon Prime thing on my, my people <laughs> and, and they bought in. Um, but that buying in, that's part of the answer of where we need to start figuring things out. So it isn't just our farming. It isn't just organic versus the industrial model. It isn't just reaching consumers through the supermarkets. There's many sh shifts we need to make. But when we bring it down to the human level, to the connections that make possible small local agriculture, um, I think that's what we need to build on. I agree. Um, I'm so impressed with uh, the work of some of the farms that I get to talk to. Out in California, you know, Full Belly Farm is just amazing in their threads, mm -hmm. <laughs> mycelium running out into the community in so many ways that they've, they've, uh, you know, it's a, it's a big, it's a big farm and, you know, it's got a, a large number of family generations involved. It's great. But, uh, I know several farmers, including one who lives five miles from me that, that learned how to farm on their farm working there. And, but, but that conscious, realization that we need to build the community and you know i can say to anybody listening to this you should come to lost nation orchard during apple season next year and it's beautiful and the apples are great and uh it's a, always a pleasure to see michael so um yeah that it's one of the things that i see is it's not enough for us to grow good food we need to grow good food but we also need to engage with the community about that. It's got to be a, a community effort. And, and we need to innovate on our own terms so that it works for us and for our families. You know, we're at the, the heart of it. We're the producers. Um, and we're asked to play many different roles. But again, getting back to that other core principle, we need to be happy in work that we love, in stewardship of soil, plants, all this beautiful earth. Um, because without that, we're also not going to be whole. And the growers need to be whole. Well, that's probably the perfect place to end. So, Michael Phillips, thank you so much for talking with me today. Thank you, Dave. I think it's time to go get your northern spies. Good. Thank you for listening to The Real Organic Podcast. We hope that you will subscribe, tell your friends, and leave us a rating and review. A video version of this interview, as well as the full transcript with links related to our conversation can be found at realorganicproject.org forward slash episode 35. Please join us next time for an interview with Nora Taleb of Naturland, Germany's longtime successful farmer-led organic label, an organization we have been working with closely as we try to accomplish similar goals here in the U.S. 
To find a real organic farm near you, visit realorganicproject.org forward slash farms. <laughs>